Okay, good morning, everybody. You're all very welcome to this practice news on the 3rd of September 2021. Practice news is news for members in practice, both uh, Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. So you are very welcome, presented by ourselves from Practice Consulting. Now, a lot going on in the world at the moment of practice. We just move on to what our headlines are today. Uh, the new world of work. Um, no going back now. Well, actually, everybody is going back now. And what impact is is this having uh, on, on, on you? What are the legal aspects of this? What are the practical aspects, the human aspects of going back to work? So we're delighted to have Blonet Evans of Le Mans Solicitors going to be having a conversation with Jeremy about that in a few minutes. Uh, the SME facing insolvency. Once again, uh, it, 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 it's, a, it's a great time for some companies, difficult time for others. Uh, if it gets to a point where a company is in such financial difficulties that it needs to um, go into an insolvency arrangement, what are the options open? So we're going to be talking to Michael Drum of Cavanagh Kelly in Northern Ireland, and we're going to be talking to Jim Stafford of Free of Stafford in Dublin about the various options that are open to companies both north and south. So looking forward to that. That is our final, our final piece of, of, of the day. So hold on for that. Tax, as always, loads going on for, uh, in, in the world of tax. So we're delighted, of course, to have Nora Collander back to talk to you about what is going on in the world of tax. Um, now, some coming items. Uh, sole practitioner auditors. If you are a sole practitioner and you are on the Irish Audit Register, whether you're in the north or in the south, you are going to need an alternate. OK, so we're going to be talking to you about that, how and when and why and what you need to be doing next. All right. EEA residence director requirements can be a difficulty if your only directors are from outside of the EEA, such as the United Kingdom. So what are we doing about that? What are we saying? What, what is our ask there? We're going, to, we're going to discuss that. There's also a new Irish Corporate Enforcement Authority coming down the tracks at us. A bit, a bit about that. And finally, there are going to be roles for accountants in the new assisted decision making processes. So uh, this is once again something which may not actually happen until the new year, but it's something that you need to be thinking about now and developing your expertise in or developing your knowledge of now if, if this is something that you want to do. So there we go. Those are the things we're going to be covering over the course of today's practice news. And of course, a few bits and pieces of a few other chunks and nuggets of news uh, that is going to be a relevance to yourself. So this is our usual team. Delighted to have Nora, of course, back, our tax lead here in Chartered Accountants Ireland. And of course, myself and Jeremy are going to be uh, talking it through. I think you're all very familiar with ourselves. As I say, we have Michael Drum of Kavanagh Kelly in Northern Ireland. Michael Drum, the head of their insolvency uh, practice there in in, in, in Kavanagh Kelly. Blonard Evans, a, an expert in employment law from Le Mans solicitors and Jim Stafford of Freel Stafford. Jim needs no introduction, a uh, well-known insolvency practitioner here in Dublin. So uh, delighted to have all of those give you a full in, 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 in introduction ahead of your actual pieces. So we'll move on there now, but I'd say absolutely thrilled to have you and looking forward to having uh, a discussion with you all. Now, who are you? Who are our practitioners, our, our, our participants to, to today this is who you are uh, largely fcas people 10 years qualified with some acas and some non-members all very welcome mainly members in practice and employed in practice some members in business absolutely there's just there's something for everybody in this the age distribution is a very young 47 uh, and we've got a, a a good split of male and female and as you can see we, uh, you are from all over the island of ireland uh so you can see north and south, uh, east, west, north, south, you name it. Uh, we have got people from there. I would suggest we've got somebody from every county in Ireland. But there we go. So it's delighted. As always, you need to remember that this is, I mean, we're going to be covering quite a few technical topics in this, but we're going to be covering them at breakneck speed, which does mean that they are going to be very much truncated. And even, you know, the pieces I'm doing, I'm conscious I'm leaving stuff out. So do go back to the source material when you're going, when, when you're giving advice to clients. But anything like this, this is severe limitations. We're here to raise your awareness of these issues, not to give you uh, the full wax on them. All right, there we go. Now, our update. So I will kick off uh, this one. Myself and Jeremy are going to uh, talk to you about what is new in the world for practices. But... Uh, I'll just kick off by saying coming down the tracks at us is a new set of audit regulations in ROI. Uh, and now we've talked to already about the new CPD requirements. Uh, a lot of IASA uh, indicated requirements are included in these. We've talked about the new, the new CPD 
requirements, which we're going to hear more about. Uh, but today, what I actually want to talk about is if you are a sole practitioner and you are involved in audit, there is going to be a requirement to have an alternate. What's an alternate? An alternate is somebody to step into your shoes should you become uh, incapacitated or should pass away. OK, so uh, myself and Jeremy have unfortunately had to, had to help a, a number of, of families uh, and, and, and so forth over, over time where, where, uh, where a sole practitioner has passed away. Uh, and it's very, very difficult when there is no alternate. Okay, it, makes, it, it does make the whole process so much smoother if there's a person there who can step in. Uh, it's also a huge protection for the clients. Uh, and for that reason, IASA, once again, has said, look, this is what you need. Uh, it is for auditors. Uh, up until now, if you have uh, been involved, if you had client money or if you've been uh, if you had an insolvency practicing certificate, you've needed to have an alternate uh, from now on. Just being involved in audit, just being a registered auditor is going to require that on, if you are on the Irish audit register. That's the criteria. It's going to come in in 2022. Now, look, the, the, these audit regs are being drafted at the moment, uh, so we we don't know the full shape of them or the exact shape of them. So uh, if you ask us a detailed question about this, we probably won't know the answer because this is as much as we know, but we think it's important to get this information out to you as soon as possible. What's the action point now? The action point is to be looking around for a, uh, a person who is also a registered auditor in a, on the ROI register who can step into your shoes should something untoward happen to yourself, okay? So you need to be thinking about that now. That's what we'll be asking people to be doing now and maybe having that conversation with the person exactly what the ask is of that person we'll get to in due course but uh, be, because this is something where sometimes people you speak to people and say mm, i don't know anybody who would do that for me uh it's something to be thinking about now it, you may have a year in order to get it in place but as i say uh it's a big ask it really is a big ask uh so you do need to be thinking about it now there we go that's where we're at now. Now I'm going to hand over to Jeremy, who's going to talk about new auditor supports. Indeed. Now, another one for the auditors. I have three or four news items here, but yeah, I'm going to kick off on the new uh, compendium of auditor reports for the UK and Northern Ireland from the FRC. Now, uh, I'm sure many of you will be familiar with the two compendiums of auditor reports that are available from uh, IASA for the Republic of Ireland, issued actually just, uh, would have been last winter. And uh, that is still current and still available at the bottom link there. But actually, as a result of Brexit and obviously the legal references and legal changes, the March 2020 compendium by the FRC. Now, each of these compendiums contain, I think, the UK version, the FRC version, uh, eight different audit reports. They vary from small company, UK gap, right up to more complicated groups and entities using IFRS and so on. But if you're not already familiar with them or actually uh, want to download a copy, I think any auditor should have them. You can get the latest version of the FRC one at the actual link uh, here. Again, it is, I think, vital to actually have. And uh, what I would say to you as well is bottom line there, uh, the one thing they don't add in is your Bannerman paragraph. Of course, being very clear that your audit report is and what its responsibilities are towards third parties who may be using that audit report for whatever other different reasons that it wasn't uh, created in that context. But if you haven't already, uh, please do download both of those compendiums and have them and be familiar with them as to what exactly you should have in your audit report for the different sizes of companies in the two jurisdictions. Cornell, if you can click on to the next slide. And the next slide here is just as you mentioned in the actual introduction. This is one that has been of particular relevance uh, for Northern Ireland directors and for their agents and for accountants based in Northern Ireland. And uh, give you a bit of background here, uh, Section 137 of the Companies Act 2014 requires that an Irish registered company has at least one EEA resident director. And until 31 December 2020, that of course uh, could include a uh, director who is resident in the UK, including Northern Ireland, there was no problem there. Now, Brexit, of course, has thrown up anomalies and questions in this area. And since actually uh, late 2020, uh, earlier this year, the Institute has been following up with both the CRO and with the Department of Enterprise and Antonis Jalia Varadkar uh, to get a exact a clarification in this area. Uh, the CRO has uh, thus far not been treating Northern Ireland uh, res uh, resident directors as being EEA resident in this context. 
And we followed up a number of times. And what has happened is Leo Varadkar, uh, the Minister of Enterprise, uh, Tonshta, actually asked the Attorney General for legal advice uh, in light of what's in, in the actual trade and cooperation agreement agreed between Britain and the EU uh, with relation to Brexit last December. Now, that was last April, and we still have heard nothing back. A number of members still contacting us. So just last week, our Brexit lead, uh, Corona Clausey, wrote again this letter here, and I would have highlighted it in social media as well, to Antonishta, stating the urgency of this matter and that we really need to get clarification here. We still await an answer, but as soon as possible, we are going to, uh, when we do have the details back from the Tornishta, from the CRO and the advice here from the CNAG, and hopefully it'll be a positive answer, we will be communicating that to our members. So rest assured, we are still following up on this issue and we are still advocating and lobbying with the relevant minister and the CRO on this matter. So Cornell, if you can click ahead again. Uh, great. Now, the next one here is with relation to, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, with this, is uh, the replacement to the OECE. Obviously, this is something that has been mooted for the last three or four years. And what, what has supposed to change in government with the COVID crisis, there has been a slowness in getting legislation and getting things onto the agenda on the uh, government front. But actually, just in August, uh, great news that the next vital step, the actual cabinet and the government approving uh, the bill uh, for the actual, uh, it was the company's bill, uh, Corporate Enforcement Authority Bill 2021, that will actually be the step in forming uh, the new enhanced corporate enforcement authority to replace the ODCE. Now, this new uh, authority is going to be considerably larger, have a lot more resources. I think some of the potential, if I'm going to call the word, failings that have been levied against the ODC sometimes has been on a resourcing fund with relation to its uh, specialists, accountants, lawyers, also members of Angola Shikona. So quite a sizable increase in resourcing there and also in budget and also potentially its powers as well with relation to sanctioning of non-compliant company directors and non-compliance with company law. So this, I think, is, I think everyone will agree, much heralded and much needed. Now, the next steps here is that the minister is going to bring this to the houses of the Oireachtas and formally for debate through the Dáil and the Shannon. Hopefully we'll see that this act will go through the actual Oireachtas and for signature by the president over the coming months, over the winter months. And that can then allow the new CEA uh, to be uh, in place, hopefully sometime in 2022. These are all conjecture timelines by me, but hopefully we are seeing progress on that. And just to give you a heads up that we will see this new body coming along fairly soon. Cornell, if you can click ahead again. Next one here uh, is with relation to uh, the uh, Central Register of Beneficial Ownership of Trust, the CERBOT. And again, like the RBO a couple of years back, uh, this is something that has come from AML legislation, the Fifth Directive and the 2021 Act that came in uh, formally into place in April of this year. Uh, stipulated, and this comes from, of course, EU legislation and requirements that uh, there needs to be a, a central register of beneficial owner for trusts, like there was one for companies uh, for the last uh, two years or so. Now, one here is that the actual administration of this uh, trust register and portal is going to fall to revenue. So actually trustees or their agents uh, can actually register through the trust register portal on the revenue website. Again, the key dates for your February to remember and the key takeaway action this happened over the summertime. The formally the register was actually opened on the 26th of July. So if you're an agent, obviously you will have some trusts uh, in your actual uh, in your portfolio and you may need to assist them on this. For trust in existence on the 23rd of April of this year, they have six months to actually register their details in the central register of their beneficial ownership. Uh, with revenue. So first thing for you to do if you haven't already signed up as an agent is to actually sign up uh, with revenue online and be available to do this for your clients and then to facilitate your clients by 23 October, which is coming around fairly quick. For any new trusts that are created after the 23rd of April, they have that six month window to get everything internally and externally up on the actual register as well. And of course, changes that happen as well, I think within 14 days have to be from the internal register onto the external register. If you want to learn more how to actually register with ROS, what's uh, exactly involved here, click that link at the bottom slide of the slide here and you'll learn a lot, lot more. So that's your one takeaway here. If you do one thing today, register yourself with revenue and be ready to go on this one. Cornell, that's my four news items. A lot covered there, a lot of learning for you to go away with as well. Back to you, I think you're going to tell us about assisted decision making. I am. Just before I do that, someone says, how long does it take to quit audit? Um, quite quick, if you want to quit audit, uh, write to Professional Standards Department in Belfast. 
but you also need to advise all of your clients. You need to do all your filings uh, if you're in the ROI uh, with um, with the um, company's ha- uh, company's office and uh, and with IASA. So you need to do all of that, and also the company many two many two filings also. So yeah, it's it, it it's quite a quick process to pull out of audit. Right. So uh, oh yeah, and, and, and somebody else is asking why don't you include why don't IASA include a Bannerman paragraph in their published. Uh, versions of the auditor supports and the FRC don't do it either. The answer for that is that it is a practice protection measure. It's not a requirement. It's a practice protection measure. It is to protect the practitioner. And indeed, you know, it, it, it it's something where uh, I asked, it will say, well, why should we protect you? We're, 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 we're protecting both sides, uh, the, the client and you. If you don't put it in, well, the client has more options um to 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 um to uh, deal with the situation. So it's it, this is advice to the practice right assisted decision making right uh, in now uh, move on to the slide first i guess there we go assisted uh, decision making uh there is a, an assisted decision making capacity act passed in roi in 2015 as happens with a lot of legislation most of that act has not yet been commenced but it is in the process of being commenced uh, and there are are also going to be uh, codes of practice and guidance issued by the, the Decision Support Service, the new Decision Support Service, which is getting up and running. Essentially, uh, there's going to be a consultation process on, on, on these codes of practice. Uh, essentially, what it's all about is it is discontinuing the ward of court structure. Okay. At present, if a person is unable to make decisions for themselves and there's an estate involved, there's money involved, then uh, that person is made a ward of court, can be made a ward of court, uh, and a committee acts for the ward of court. That process is, 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 is going to be discontinued and will be passed over to the new structures uh, which are, are here. There's going to be three levels of support which are relevant to perhaps us as accountants, decision-making assistant, somebody who can assist, uh, somebody with reduced capacity, uh, a co-decision maker, somebody who can make decisions along with that person, and a decision-making representative appointed by the circuit court in this instance. Um, and uh, there's going to be a process whereby if the financial affairs are complex, if it's a business involved or so forth, or a complex estate involved, uh, a chartered accountant in practice or an accountant in practice uh, can be a decision-making representative. And there are provisions whereby that person can charge for their services. So this may be a service line that people can offer. As I understand it, uh, the Decision Support Service is going to be compiling a panel of accountants who are interested in this. Uh, There's also a process whereby uh, the existing decision support arrangements will be reviewed by what's called a general visitor. And as I understand it, they are going to be uh, assembling a panel to uh, carry out that work also. So it may be something that chartered accountants are interested in. Uh, We will keep you informed as soon as we know more. That is uh, the statement of intent by the Decision Support Service as of now. So it's something just to to, uh, be aware of, to be looking into it, have a look at the Act, have a look at the various structures within the Act, if this is something that you are interested in, and watch out for further news about it. And now that's that done. So I'm going to move over uh, and I'm going to pass you over to Nora, who is going to give you our tax update. Nora, over to you. Thanks very much, Colin. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I hope you're all well. Um, I'd like to start today by giving you a state of play on the tax debt warehousing scheme and section uh, 907A um, interaction with a director of a company and their entitlement to a credit that's been uh, for pay YE that's been warehoused. So this was uh, the flagship issue in the CCABI's pre-budget submission, which was sent to all TDs and senators. And we also did a cover letter specifically addressing this issue. So if they, they got one paying out of the pre-budget submission, it was that this was a problem, potential problem for directors of SMEs as they face into filing their income tax returns in October and November. We've also discussed this with revenue. Um, the revenues view at the moment is that they don't see this as being a widespread issue. Now, having said that, there are 52,000 uh, companies in the tax debt warehousing scheme who have pay YE warehoused. So it's very difficult for us, the practitioners, to see how this couldn't be an issue. And certainly it's coming to me uh, from the feedback I'm getting from the membership that this is a problem. 
Uh, the, the goal of the CCABI pre-budget submission uh, as was launched you know, on the 2nd of July was to try and get some kind of a legislative change into the COVID-19 Act, which was um, brought into legislation in the end of July. However, that didn't happen. So as it, as it is at the moment, revenue has to work within the parameters of a legislative restriction, which will not allow a credit for PayYE, which is not paid by the time the director is submitting his or her tax return. We are trying to work with revenue on coming up with a pragmatic arrangement because effectively you have a situation here where you have two entities are on the hook for the same um, tax uh, liability and potentially face interest for the servicing of that liability. Um, I would flag to you that at the last health meeting, it was uh, noted by revenue that if a director goes to file his or her tax return now, that it will look as if they do have the pay OIE uh, as a credit against their total tax liability. And then a caseworker and revenue will compare the file then to the tax debt warehousing scheme and they then will make an adjustment. So just because Ross isn't uh, throwing up uh, a liability for the director doesn't mean that there isn't a liability because the credit will not be available if the company the director works for has pay YE with us. Um, it's an ongoing issue and we'll be keeping members up to date. Uh, we have TALC next week, TALC Collections and Main TALC, and we've tabled it for discussion at both TALCs. So we're hoping that we can come up with a, a practical arrangement and a clear line for accountants um, to apply as they advise their um, clients at this busy time. So the next issue there I just want to acknowledge is the tax deadlines. We're heading into a very, very busy season for all accountancy firms. So we have the September 23rd deadline for most corporation tax filings. And then we have the 31st of October stroke, uh, the 17th of November uh, self-assessment income tax deadline submissions. We are aware that firms are under pressure again this year due to the disruption of COVID-19. We are aware that uh, firms have staff who are out sick or who are, or are close contacts and they're restricted from their activities. And of course, I, we know that uh, accountants were providing huge amount of support to SMEs uh, in getting through and getting access to all the government supports. So that's eaten up a huge chunk of time, which would normally have gone to preparing corporation tax returns, audits for the corporation tax returns, and likewise the income tax uh, deadline requirements. We are going to discuss this with revenue at Main Talc next week. We have it on the agenda. We'll be making representations that the uh, revenues telephone lines need to be open on a full-time basis. At the moment, most of those telephone lines are open on a restricted basis. Uh, the obvious one is we don't want any more deadlines announced between now and the end of the tax year um, to do with anything uh, relating to wage supports. Um, bearing in mind what happened last year where we had the TWSS uh, reconciliation was sprung upon uh, accountants there about in September whereby reconciliations had to be filed on the 31st of October. So we'll be, we'll be asking revenue to ensure that there's no um, uh, unforeseen deadlines announced and we'll be looking for the suspension of audits and interventions. Now that is customary whereby revenue would suspend field audit activity uh, during the income tax deadline season. So we'll be just looking uh, for rep making representations for that to be tailored into currently how audits are conducted, which is generally remote uh, auditing and interventions. So please watch out for updates we'll be making um, in tax news and e-news. We'll be keeping you uh, uh, informed of how our representations go with revenue. Revenue are on record by saying that they, all, they will take a pragmatic approach in dealing with compliance issues and uh, recognising uh, COVID-19 disruption. So just then to move on to supports, um, we are all very much aware of the uh, Employment Wage Subsidy Scheme eligibility review form deadlines, which were announced on foot of the extension of the EWSS to the end of the year, uh, as announced by the Minister in June. So Revenue have formalised uh, the eligibility review form process whereby an employer has to formally file a return online and uh, set out uh, their um, turnover uh, for the purposes of ensuring their eligibility. So there was a, a very short turnaround period there for the first deadline for the June eligibility review form and the CCABI lobbied for an extension of that 
deadline from the 31st of July to the 15th of August. Now, there was also a subsequent um, grace period given uh, whereby employers who did not have their forms uh, submitted by the 15th of August didn't have their EWSS payments suspended. And that grace period was in place up to this Wednesday. So the message from revenue is um, for those employers who are still eligible and uh, still can put in their eligibility review form. And once the review forms are in, the, the payments that were suspended will be processed. So all is not lost. It's not uh, like a, a, a cold hard shutter is coming down on uh, the EWSS payments for employers. We do, we have been saying to revenue and they do recognize that this is a very busy time. A lot of employers were, were very busy trying to get their businesses up and running with the lifting of the restrictions and they had a lot to deal with and that this was just something that they weren't prepared for at the time. So the message there is there's still time for the employers to get in uh, the eligibility review form and resume payment of the EWSS. So just to do a quick flag of the other supports, so we have the Business Resumption Support Scheme. Uh, that is, is a scheme that is similar to the CRSS scheme, whereby the qualifying business will get an advanced uh, trade credit then, which will come off, uh, be deducted once they're back up and running and, uh, and, and, and working as normal, uh, hopefully in the next year. So it's a once-off payment of uh, 15000 and it is uh, of up to 15000 Sorry, it's not a flat of 15000 it's of up to 15000 So applications will be uh, available, can be made between September and the 30th of November. The, the portal for uh, applying has not opened yet, but Revenue have told us that this is due to open in early September. So keep an eye out that, on that for the purposes of your client. Uh, who may qualify for the business resumption support scheme. And then there's also the music entertainment business assistance scheme, Mark II. This is operated by the Department of um, um, uh, Hospitality and Tourism. And it is uh, the closing date for applications on that is the 30th of September. So that is a, a hard shutter on that uh, application process. And it's a payment of a flat payment of 1500 euro for businesses that are impacted that work in the music sector. So it's it's not something uh, that's administered by revenue, but it is something that uh, may be of interest to your client. So uh, keep an eye out for that and note that the, the, the cutoff period is the 30th of September. So I just want to give you a quick update on another issue that uh, you need to be aware of, and that's the electronic professional service withholding tax. This system was launched in July. Now, it is a good development in that we are taking unnecessary paper out of the system. I've had members telling me for years how burdensome and cumbersome it is to be tracking down their clients' F45s, going through the whole thing, doing their, their calculations and making sure then that they're properly uh, recognized in, their, in, in the tax return. So we've been, we have been actively asking revenue to um, automate the process of uh, professional service withholding tax. And that's what they have done. However, there could be a glitch in the system as it's currently um, put forward in that, okay, we're not going to have paper F45s anymore. So instead the specified person, that is the person who is carrying out uh, the service for uh, the public um, or, or semi-state body, they are going to receive payment notifications on ROS. And those payment notifications then are going to be linked up to that individual's uh, Form 11 or Form 12, as the case may be, because they're recognising that it could apply to pay YE taxpayers or um, the, the CT1. So, but it is specifically going to be linked up to the tax profile of the specified person. Now, we've been told by members that there could be a problem for this in terms of GP practices, whereby uh, the GMS arrangement with the HSE is that a instead of, uh, while the, the, the arrangement may be in place with the GP practice, the HSE requires that a treating doctor is listed on the F45 and is traditionally listed, therefore, to all intents and purposes as the specified person. But that treating doctor may be an employee of the practice. So uh, traditionally what's been happened is the practice 
has been taking the F45s from the employee doctor. And the practice has been uh, declaring the income for tax purposes and claiming the credit. But now as the, the treating doctor will be named on the notification payment, it's the, the, the credit will be going to the treating doctor who might not necessarily have traditionally been the person who was accounting for the income. Uh, in their tax return. So look, we're working with this, uh, with revenue at the moment. Revenue are, their view is that the specified person is the treating doctor and therefore they are the person who should be taxable on the income and claiming credit. But we've prepared a submission and we're, we're taking this to TAG for further consideration. Um, it is not something that was uh, specifically um, known to revenue at the time that they were developing the system. Um, now we are hoping that we can we can come to some kind of a practical arrangement with this, but this is the situation as it currently stands. So I just want to bring that to your attention. Uh, I think that this probably will come to a head next um, year because the uh, the state that or the the e uh, professional service withholding tax system has been introduced uh, halfway through 2021. So uh, doctors or would be uh, claiming the credits in their income tax returns, which will be filed October 2022. So hopefully between now and then, well, we can come to some arrangement with revenue on this. But I just want to put you in the picture as it currently stands. I just want to also flag, I'm getting questions in from members about difficulties in uh, preparing accounts uh, in respect of asserting, uh, ascertaining the payee position of a business because statements don't issue any more from revenue in respect of payee. Now, this is something uh, that we have, this, the, the Institute under the auspices of the CCABI have been discussing with revenue since late last year, earlier this year, uh, and they need to uh, develop this uh, uh, on the PayYE system, a PayYE modernization, real-time payment of PayYE system. So I have been talking to developers. I have been explaining the uh, the issues that accountants have been encountering in this. Uh, I don't believe that there will be um, a summary statement available for in 2021. They are telling me that they are what they're hoping to have one in place for early 2022. So I just want to flag that with you that we are aware of it. We do know that this is extremely difficult for accountants to, to try and work out uh, what's going on with the PayYE statement, especially when we consider the year that's gone by in 2020, when we might have had uh, the payroll operator actually running the payroll. It might have been another um, the principal of the business or another employee stepping into the breach to, to operate PayYE and all the the uh, intrinsities and difficulties that were thrown up the wage supports. So look, that's just a, a, a whistle stop of where we are at the moment. Please keep uh, in touch with us through tax news and e-news. And there'll be a lot going on in um, the next week or so because we are in with revenue via TAC. So thank you so much for your time today. And as always, I'm happy to take any queries or uh, if you want to contact me directly with any representational issues, I'd be happy to take those up uh, on your behalf. Nora, thank you very, very much uh, as ever, a, a very, very comprehensive uh, review. I know that there's a few questions after coming in there, and uh, I know, of course, we're coming into uh, that point to the tax deadlines and the pressures that practices are under. So there's a few in, in particular there, as I say to you. What we might say is, I know you're very good sometimes at answering them in the chat function, specific ones or Q&A. And if there's something that we kind of, you, you see there in the q and I'll leave you read yourself and we want to come back and talk about in, in a few minutes or towards the end of the show, we'll give answers as well as I say to you. Uh, but no, thank you very, very much for that. And, and I suppose thank you for all your, your efforts as well in dealing when I know it's a very busy period coming up with, uh, with revenue. There was one question that was just raised there uh, by Fiona and uh, in uh, one of our attendees today about uh, tax deadline season, but also so uh, having been nominated by professional standards for a monitoring visit or a compliance visit, I understand. Now, if you do happen to be in that situation, my understanding is, of course, you can uh, discuss with professional standards and look to reschedule a visit. Uh, usually they're quite accommodating in this regard. Mm -hmm. um, so don't feel that you're obliged that you have to, just because they, they can't contact you and say they'd like to have a visit in a few weeks or whatever, that if you can outline reasoning why, and obviously the deadlines and the work you're coming under and the particular pressures your firm is under, you can discuss this with them. And usually they're very accommodating to find a... Uh, a time that works for you both. Uh, it's, uh, as I say to you, it could be a, a couple of months down the line, whatever it is like that. So Fiona, uh, what I'd say to you there is do talk to professional standards, uh, do uh, outline your situation, 
and do try to uh, get, um, as I say to you, um, extra time if you need it. Uh, so hopefully that will work for you. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and I think Fiona has put in something else there as well. So it's something we may, we may take up off, offline. Uh, but as I say to you, um, that's that's that one there. And that's what our general advice would, would, would be on that one, Fiona. But happy to uh, to take a, a, a chat with you offline on that as well, if needed. Listen, on that one, I'm going to uh, say thank Nora. And we'll be, I'm sure we'll be back to it later on in the show. But it's time to, uh, to move on. And our next actual uh, part here today is with relation to... Um, the new world of work. And I suppose a topic that's very, very timely, uh, as uh, particularly this week in uh, the Republic of Ireland, we have the Irish government setting out uh, the end game, we'll call it, or the wind down of uh, restrictions and what, when it's likely and so on. And of course, that impacts the return to the office. Of course, we're, we're all familiar that a lot of small accountancy practices and so on have had a presence and have been back in the office for a very long time, maybe not in full capacity, certain staff working from home, different things like this. And really, uh, this is a very timely and a good opportunity as we emerge from the crisis now, hard to imagine 18 months since uh, March 2020, the world of work we face is dramatically different to uh, the world of work that we entered uh, this crisis. And um, I'm delighted to welcome back uh, Blana Evans, who is Head of Employment and Immigration with um, Le Mans Solicitors. And I know, Blana, uh, you joined us, I think, about a year ago as well. And at that stage, it was the, the tin of getting back into the office. We're more looking at the practicalities, different things after the first uh, three months actual uh, lockdown. And uh, myself and Blana had had a chat earlier on in the week, uh, just planning out this, this talk and different things. And I suppose one of the first things really is where we're talking about the experiences we're seeing in I'm, that I'm seeing in talking to small accountancy mm -hmm. practices, uh, the different options that are there with relation to uh, in, an entire return to the office, maybe a hybrid model, maybe people that wish to work entirely remotely. And then we were sharing experiences that Blonde, you're seeing in your own firm and also in dealing with clients. So I suppose the first thing really is over to yourself. What are you what are you seeing in talking to clients in your own firm, your experiences of what models are out there and what's uh, what's potentially on the table there? And I suppose what are the challenges and opportunities in those? Yeah, sure. Um, morning, everyone. And, and thanks very much for having me um, again today. So um there's a real mixed bag, I suppose, out there. Um, and I, I think given the sort of recent government announcement um, this week, we will be seeing more of a hybrid model. But I mean, what, I, what in my experience and what I've seen from clients and certainly, you know, we've seen the stories in the newspapers um, that anybody that has has rushed and made the decision and a firm decision to say, you know, this is the way we're going to do it. For example, everybody has to come back to the office. It hasn't worked. Um, and it's nearly acted as a sort of um, an anti-recruitment tool for that organization um, because people know now, you know, you can do the mixed piece of, you know, hybrid working, working from home and in the office. Now, certain people, it, it definitely suits them to be in the office. You know, potentially they have too much going on at home and they're too distracted. But likewise, you know, for some people, it suits them more to be at home. So, um, like from my experience and what I'm seeing with clients and what I'm recommending is, don't make a firm decision and um, work with your staff and uh, like the announcement that came in there during the week was you know from the 20th of September people can start going back into the office but the recommendation is to employers is to be flexible and it's a staggered return you know so bear that in mind and um, you know it, it you know there might and don't get me wrong now there's certain there's certain areas within businesses where you need them in the office. You know, I mean, one thing, Jeremy, we were talking about was, you know, like trainees, so trainee accountants, trainee solicitors, you know, people that are learning. There is no better tool than sitting beside someone in an office and osmosis. Um, and unfortunately, you know, they're the type of workforce that have, I think, have really suffered um, in, in all of this. And, you know, I can even speak from my own experience. You know, I, I find it difficult and I've had to really adapt and, you know, and how we approach this. So, you know, what I would recommend to clients and what certainly what I'm seeing people doing is, you know, even before this announcement was made was, you know, talk to your staff, you know, see what they want to do. It's not that you're saying the staff dictate, you know, what happens, but it's, you know, OK, what would you like to do? You know, we're, we're looking at a hybrid model. You know, if we do it, it'll be on a sort of a temporary basis of, let's say, two, three months. See how that works. Um, and, you know, there's no firm decision, 
And by making it, you know, by being clear that it's temporary, it means that if it doesn't work for whatever reason, you can pull it back, you can go more in the office, you can, or, you know, sort of look at what, what particular sort of work, you know, work makeup works for, for you know, within the organization. And the other piece, which I would say is, is really crucial as part of this, um, and I know a lot of clients haven't done it before now, but I, you know, I would certainly recommend it you know, now that we have the government announcement of, you know, recommending people to go back into the workplace um, is to have um, a working from home or a hybrid policy. Um, and, you know, within that, you will have the conditions of people being able to work from home, which includes, for example, the need for people to do um, a risk assessment if they want to work from home. A risk assessment does need to be done of their workspace at home. And um, this can be done virtually. Um, you know, and like, and then on foot of that, it means then, you know, if an employee says, OK, you know, I want to work from home for X amount of days, you'll say it's on the condition that you do your work on the workspace whereby a virtual risk assessment was conducted. And it's not, you know, so then and, and the reason for that is as well for employers, it means then if an employee, for example, did a risk assessment of, you know, their workspace at home on, I don't know, the kitchen table or perhaps a desk. And then you find out that they've actually been working in the bed for the last six months and they've got back problems. And um, that helps an employer in terms of a defense with any sort of potential liability for, you know, some sort of back injury that an employee might try to claim. And it keeps the perimeters of it. And it means then, you know, an employer will have a potential to sort of pull back on that employee working from home if and if they haven't sort of stuck to the terms of the of the working from home policy. Um, and likewise, you could put you, you could put things into the working from home policy that, you know, if an employee's performance is is under review, you know, for example, if they had to be put on a performance improvement plan, then they would need to be in the office more for that, because obviously it's very difficult to manage people when they are working remotely. Um, and, you know, the, the better chance for both, both the employee and the employer would be that they are in the workplace rather than them working from home. So, um that's the sort of the main sort of points I would sort of see that are, are coming up in terms of sort of planning the return to work and, you know, thinking about how, how to do this, this safely. No, Donna, you've, you've covered a lot there, as I say to you now, and you're right. I think that the overall, my feeling on things, just like it has been throughout this crisis for government, for everyone else, is you have to take this slowly, feel your way into things. Uh, it's a, it's a, it, we haven't had a past example of this. It's a, it's a new model of working and every firm will have a different approach. And I think you so hit it on the head there as well. And we do get people from time to time ringing us and contacting us and say, I want to bring my staff entirely back into the office but if you don't uh, have that collaborative approach with relation to working with your staff, the issues they have, as you said, no, you cannot have any staff member who will be told and you totally to ransom, but you do need to work with, with your staff in this regard as well. And I suppose some of the things we've all been on the, the negative blown in relation to um, the employment situation, getting back to the office and different things. But I think some uh, practitioners and some uh, employers uh, particularly are seeing this as a very much a positive as well in that it can be an opportunity, particularly if you're in a more rural area or if you're in an area where it was difficult to hire staff before, where it opens up your actual whole opportunity to hire staff in a much wider geographic basis or maybe capture people who might be relocating from Dublin out into wider Leinster, uh, wider Munster, Connacht, wherever it may be. I suppose there's great opportunities there too. Are you seeing that with clients who are playing it smart, really? Oh, yeah, for sure. Do you know, it's, and even from sort of access to the market, you know, in terms mm. of clients, um, you know, I think if people are moving home to, to Munster, Connacht, or, you know, wherever, the wider Leinster, whatever it might be, um, you know, it's... I would say it's look at the opportunities that are there. You know, that person could be, if they're a senior person, for example, could be doing BD in, you know, in the likes of Galway Mail, which you wouldn't have necessarily been as easy to do, you yeah. know, when you're yeah. doing the commute from Dublin. So there's there's absolutely the opportunities there, um, you know, and, and people are getting, you know, more wise to it. And, you know, it means a better work-life balance for people too, that, you know, they are probably be able to have unfortunately the nicer house if they move out of Dublin you know it's a well prices are certainly going up you know it's it's definitely more affordable you know and it'd be probably as well then to be able to spend more time at home with the family 
Indeed. And that's, I suppose, there's a flip side to it as well. I always tend to go on to the negative. If you are that employer as well, I think, who is going to insist to everyone to come back, but you are now in this new world where people can work remotely. We're seeing, um, I even see it in the Linster Society survey yesterday on, on salaries. And we see it in the employment market where there seems to be a lot of people thinking about leaving their jobs, a boom with relation to professional services and financial services, uh, employment and accountancy as well included in that where your staff could be poached from you. So you need to show that flexibility, even from a defensive viewpoint, I feel as well, is, is a good thing as we, I suppose, emerge from, from this crisis. Now, before we, we move on with different things, one question, I suppose, that always kind of comes up is with relation to the practicalities. And I know it's, it's, a, it's a minefield of an area with relation to staff coming back into the office, their COVID vaccination situation, different things like that, as I say to you. Now, I know we have to see more definitive guidance on this. You probably have uh, employers on a regular basis asking you, what is my status, my situation here for asking employees on their vaccination status? Or how do I suppose, how do I satisfy employees coming in who are vaccinated, but they're worried others mightn't be and the risk then in their actual um in their actual role they're in, or maybe some have a role where it mightn't that they, they, you can't have them in that role anymore because they're not vaccinated. And I, I, lots of things are thrown out there, blowing it, but you, you may have thoughts on that. <laughs> yeah, the minefield question. Um, so I, th there has been guidance that has came out to say the only time you can ask if somebody has been vaccinated is if they're a frontline worker. Mm. So if you're not a frontline worker, you can't force the information because you have to remember it's sensitive personal data. Now, so, so bearing that in mind, you have to look at the bigger picture. Um, you can still get COVID even if you're vaccinated. So yeah. the vaccination is one of many factors that an employer, you know, well, not an employer, because obviously it's the, it's the individual's choice to have the vaccination, but it's one of many factors in terms of sort of ensuring a safe place and a safe work environment. So, you know, obviously, if you knew what people, if they've been vaccinated, it would obviously give comfort to the employer to know that staff are vaccinated. But you have to sort of look at it that, OK, they may or may not be vaccinated, but let's look at the workplace. What can I do to make this safe? Look at the return to work safety protocol. Um, I know the government sort of announced, I mean, we're still waiting on, on more detailed guidance. Mm -hmm. and We'll hopefully have that soon. But, you know, to try and have one meter social distancing, for example, in, in between desks where possible. Um, you know, and if you can't do that, perhaps it's looking at a sort of a rotation. You know, you might have one team in one day. Um, and, you know, another team in another day, you know, the insurance of good ventilation within the office and, um, you know, windows open, face masks available, you yeah. know, all the other factors all need to be sort of considered. Um, and then, you know, if if an employee. So so once you have all of that in, it, it means if somebody is vaccinated, it's nearly a positive. Um, yeah. And then, you know, so I've had clients ask me before, you know, but what if the person is a vulnerable person, you know, what if they have an underlying condition or, you know, can, can we insist in that scenario? And unfortunately you can't, um, but you will have to look at that person in an individual set of circumstances, you know, um, is that person, you know, is it safe really for that person to come back to the workplace? And that might require getting somebody from occupational health to do an assessment of that particular person, um, you know, where they would meet with them and they might make recommendations, okay, for this person to return to work, the following, you know, we would recommend the following additional measures are put in place. And then you get into, you know, whether that is, you know, achievable or whether or not, you know, that's a, it's a bigger ask than is necessary and is a disproportionate burden. So um, there's no, unfortunately, one size fits all. Um, but I would just, what I say to clients is, you know, the vaccination information is useful but you have to be careful with it too. You know, if somebody was, if people were to turn around and then be vaccinated and then by sort of, you nearly figure out who is not vaccinated and you don't allow that person back in, that likewise could get you into trouble, you know, unless you have, as I said, set out the steps and there's a reason why you've got medical um, evidence to say, you know, this person should work for home, put the following measures in place. Yeah, no, as I say to you, it is a minefield. And uh, <laughs> basically, I think you've, you've given some, I suppose, very good information and, and things for talk there, as I say to you, and also your actual top tips there uh, as well. 
I, I think overall there's a couple of questions and I know uh, Blona you're going to be staying on with us as I say until the end of the show and there's a couple of questions after coming in there on the chat some of them are particularly wondering about and you've touched upon it with relation to how can you accommodate uh, client meetings and you touched about there still keeping social distancing having masks and screens I think these things will all come out again in the uh, more detailed guidance with relation to our wind down of regulations but these still are all things we still need to be conscious of and there will be more detailed guidance coming out of another area that's coming out i think and you can have a think about this and we might have a talk about it again towards the end of the show with relation to yeah employees who have to work from home but um some people are wondering about how do you i suppose monitor the, the staff and ensure in relation to their, their work and people have to work unusual hours and non-conventional nine to five hours and so on as well that's a, a very tricky area from an employee point of view but also from an employer point of view so i'll leave you have a think about one or two of those and uh, you, you might as we might have a, a little chat at the end as i say again on, on those as i say to your questions so i'll leave you have, have a read sure. of those but listen, what I'm going to say in the meantime is, is that, uh, Blon, as you, you've been very good to give us some of those things. Our talk today is very much a, a 10 minute overview, 15 minute overview of some things that are actually a, a, an area that is very detailed, emerging all the time with relation to new guidance and legislation over the coming weeks. Uh, and I would say if somebody has a particular circumstances and they'd like to get uh, access to your expertise or to your thoughts, I know in the next slide here, you actually have uh, all your contact details and you've been good enough to say that you're, you're happy, to, I think, to talk to anybody who has a particular situation or needs advice or guidance, whatever else as well. Of course, so, yeah. So thanks for that actual offer, blown it as well, because we realize here today uh, that basically uh, these things are just giving you a quick overview. Uh, it would be even if we had three hours, we wouldn't cover all the detail. Uh, but uh, and every situation will be different. But if you can just say take a quick look at those questions and we'll have a chat again at, um, at actually at about quarter past 11 again or whatever it is. So on that note, I'm going to hand you back uh, to Cornell. And I know you're going to be joined with Michael and with Jim all on insolvency. So very good, very good. Um, that's absolutely. And just before I start into into that, I just want to give one quick clarification. Somebody was asking in the Q&A whether uh, the assisted decision making process uh, referred to uh, assisting people with dementia. Absolutely. Dementia, acquired brain injury, issues like that uh, are, 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 are situations where somebody might need uh, assistance with decision making or uh, for somebody to actually make the decisions for them. That is what we what we are talking about there. Um, now, moving on uh, to, 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 to the area of insolvency. Um, North and South. Um, thank God we haven't had the deluge of business insolvencies that was feared at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, the government supports and the you know the buoyancy in certain sectors of the economy has uh, has, has prevented that. Uh, there have been some there have been some casualties, um, of course. Um, but th the question is, what next? As always, uh, we're, 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 we're trying to crystal ball gaze and see what's next. Uh, certainly the uh, government supports north and south are even either at an end, ending or about to end, depending on the support. Uh, and obviously some sections of the economy, I am thinking of, uh, I'm thinking of uh, entertainment, hospitality, travel, all of those uh, have suffered. Uh, so what next? So to discuss this, I am delighted to welcome Michael Drum, partner in Kavanagh Kelly. Uh, he is he, he leads the uh, the business recovery and insolvency department of Kavanagh Kelly. Uh, he, he, he is um, also a qualified insolvency practitioner in Northern Ireland. Uh, I'm also delighted to have Jim Stafford. Uh, Jim would be would be widely regarded as one of Ireland's leading corporate recovery and insolvency uh, specialists. Uh, he, he also specialises uh, in, 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 in um, shareholder dis disputes, negotiations. Uh, he's also uh, drafted and delivered um, our insolvency diploma. So, Jim, uh, well qualified to speak and uh, delighted to have you on board. So I think what we'll do is we'll start with the situation in the Republic of Ireland. Uh, we have a, a new piece of legislation, freshly minted. Piece of legislation. The, the just get the, the full title. The corporate, the companies uh, rescue process for small and micro companies Act 2021, formerly known as SCARP, uh, but 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 that's what it's now known as. Uh, so, Jim, uh, I know you want to talk to us about that. Uh, how does that differ from what we previously had, Jim? And how is this going to impact uh, on, on on the corporate environment? 
Well, I suppose one, one of the few benefits of COVID, Carl, is that it prompted government to finally expedite legislation to introduce a low-cost rescue mechanism for corporate companies in this country. Uh, but Michael Drummond's had this low-cost rescue mechanism in Northern Ireland for a long time. They call it uh, um, company voluntary arrangements, which is a low-cost mechanism. And so this is a low-cost mechanism. Okay? And given that people are familiar with examinership, I think it's useful to do quick comparison between SCARPs and examinerships. Um, so essentially, you know, this slide summarizes the, the, the main differences. Um, so you can see from this that you know that you, you, you must be a small or you must be a small company to qualify. Um, it can be initiated by the director, so there's no court application, which is a massive saving. Okay. Um, unfortunately, it's more difficult to buy and stake projects in. I suppose, like you, know, you, you might have heard the saying, Colin, that, uh, that a camel was a horse designed by a committee. Um, so to a certain extent, this legislation was designed by a committee. It was designed by the company, the company Law Review Group, which had heavy input from the trade unions, heavy input from the revenue commissioners. And, um, and obviously, the revenue commissioners have had a great say in this committee. And, um, and so they, they were very persuasive in saying that the revenue could not be bound in to a SCAR unless they consented to be bound in. Now, I mean, I've been dealing with revenue as a personal solvency petitioner for the last um, seven years. And, um, and, and in a PIA, you have to get the revenue to agree to opt in. Okay? And in fairness to the revenue, now we all know the revenue are very commercial and they're tough, but they are commercial. And in 90% of the cases, they do opt in, but you have to, you have to justify it. Okay? You have to make a business case. Okay? In the same way, it's, um, we believe that the revenue will participate in SCARPs, but they're going to have to be persuaded to participate. Um, and certainly my experience dealing with revenue in PIAs and DSAs is that if they feel there's been a tax fraud carried, carried on or that if the, if the debtor is gaming the system, okay, um, that, that they won't participate, okay? And if you don't have the revenue participation, well, then you won't get a write down of their debt. Now, in some cases, the revenue are not always the, the largest creditor, okay? But in many cases, they are. And the only reason, the only way revenue will reduce their debt is by is is by a court a court type mechanism. Okay, but I suppose the main difference main difference between scarf and examinership is, is is going to be the costs. If you look at the last like the last bullet point, if you like, okay, this is going to be a low cost mechanism. Okay, has provided no creditors object. Okay, an accountant can do this process from beginning to end without any input from, from legals, from barristers and um, solicitors, okay? Whereas in an examinership, more costly, you have to start off the independent expert um, uh, report, which typically costs about four to 5,000 euro. You need a company solicitor and a company barrister to bring the petition to, to, to the high court or the circuit court. Um, then you've got the fees of the examiner, and then you've got the fees of the examiner's solicitor and the examiner's barrister, okay? Um, so, I say the low cost mechanism is the main point here. So let's move on to the. To, now, I am giving a detailed talk in this call next week, um, next Friday. Um, and I'm giving a detailed talk jointly with Mason Hayes and Kern, um, which will talk in detail about the necessary steps. And if, you know, given that we only have 10 minutes here, I'm only touching on this. Okay? So, what steps should clients be taking now to avail of the rescue process? Okay? Now, if you step back from this, I know that there's 52,000 companies that, that have that. Have that or tax debt and warehousing, okay? And in my experience, Colin, Irish businessmen are very optimistic as to their recovery prospects. And, oh, and if, if you give them any type of a hand, he'll take it to help them out. But a lot of companies have availed of the, of the tax warehousing. But when the tax warehousing ends, okay, will they be able to survive, okay? And of those 52,000, um, I, I believe that, that, that some of them won't, okay? Um, unless they get some of the tax debt written off, okay? So they're going, to have, they're going to have to consider, you know, a scar. I was to market size this call. Um, I was talking with Michael Drummer earlier, and I, I, Michael says in UK but that about 15% of companies will do a CVA. I said that in the Republic of Ireland, the market for SCARP is about 10%. So that I, companies that would normally go, go into liquidation, about 10% 10, 10 of them could be saved. But let's, let's not forget, Paul, that the classic Irish solution to financial difficulties, particularly dealing with revenue commissioners, um, is just liquidated by the assets back from the liquidator, okay? And so mm. many businesses can be saved like that, and many businesses are saved like that, okay? Mm. I mean, what steps should clients be taking now? 
well, um, if, if they have any business uh, business interruption claims um, progressing, they need to they need to finalise those. They should possibly um, consider implementing a pay freeze, expect to certain creditors, implementing a redundancy program, surrendering leases to landlords. Okay, now there was a there was a, an examship case there. Um, recently called, it was called a new luck examinership, examinership case. And one thing about these court cases when they come out, they, they nudge the boundaries <coughs> a little bit and they give us new lessons, okay? And what we learned from the new luck examinership case is that you shouldn't really go into an examinership, in this case, you shouldn't go into a scar process with landlords, okay? Unless you engage with the landlords pre-process, but some landlords might actually do a deal with it. Okay? You might have to go into SCAR, okay? Um, so very important to engage with landlords now, but some, la- some landlords might engage. And what we're doing at the moment as a practice, if those SCAR isn't effective, okay, we're using it as a negotiation tool to convince landlords that if you don't accept this deal, we will go into SCAR and force you to accept a, a deal and get a dividend anyway. So, do, so what do you want to do? In the same way that that we use PIAs, that we use the threat of PIA to persuade a vulture fund to accept a dividend, we can say to the vulture fund, well, if you don't do this, we're going to do a PIA and you're going to get less than a PIA. So what do you want to do? So SCARPs are a very useful mechanism to, or the threat of doing a SCARP can be a very useful tool to persuade creditors to, to, to accept a deal. Okay? So definitely engage with landlords, but particularly retailers. Okay? Bring evaluations of buildings, plant machinery, bring management council state. Um, one thing I've learned from PIAs and DSAs with revenue, the revenue will not talk at you, okay, and will not agree to opt in unless all tax returns are submitted, period. Okay. So all, all CT1s, and, and one I remember one PIA, they, they even insisted that RTT or RDDs on VAT returns have to be submitted as well. So make sure all, all VAT returns, all tax returns are submitted. Um, if you have, if your operation of bank account is an old draft, let's say 50,000, you might, you might need to open up a new bank account or another bank to avoid sell-off issues because you know, as you deposit the money, the, the bank might um, have an automatic right of sell-off, all that type, all, all that type of stuff. And um, the big issue for scarves would be retention of title um, clauses. So you, know, you, need to, you need to consider them. And Colin, if you move on to the next slide. Okay. And then commence you know, preparing a packet of information to process advisor. Remember, a scar, a process advisor only has 42 days to pull its game together. So he has to get out of starting blocks very, very quickly, okay? An exam should be kind of 100, 150 days, okay? So basically, I mean, we don't plan to do any scarf unless we more or less have a scheme more or less devised from the outset that we know what we're going to propose. Yeah. By the time you notify creditors, they come back with proofs of debt, 42 days goes very, very quickly, okay? So you need to be organized and, and you need to have, I've got a list of information there to give to the process advisor. Obviously, a point of experience and so on, to guide you to, um, through the process. And um, some companies are facing, facing financial difficulty now, and investors might be considering putting money in now, Carl, okay? But ideally, they should raise the rescue process. Now, but as, if the director's spending 50,000 now, and the statement for us, that's going to show, just show us the director's loan, which can be written down as a scar. It's mm-hmm. a, lot, a lot better to say, well, listen, I'm not putting in 50,000 now, I'm going to do a scar, and to encourage the creditors to do a deal, I'm going to promise to put 50,000 down. Okay, um, I'm conscious I have to give Michael some 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 air time in this, so I'll I'll finish on that. That that is very very interesting, Jim. I mean, I, I you know if this is going to be ten percent of of sort of commercial insolvency events, this is going to yeah. this is going to be big. Michael, how does this compare? I just get back to uh, we don't have us. We just get back to it now. How does this compare to the situation in Northern Ireland? There was uh, legislation last year which brought in a, a number of, 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 of new structures, if, 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 if you like. Certainly the one that we were talking about uh, when we were talking earlier was about moratoriums. How are they looking now at the moment, Michael? What's, what, what's going on in Northern Ireland with, with that? Or how, I mean, how would you compare that to the situation in the Republic, if you like? Hi, Colin. Thanks for um, having me on. Um, yes, I suppose back in June 2020, there was, I suppose, wide-ranging changes to the UK um, and so obviously legislation. Um, some of those were, I suppose, planned um, pre-COVID um, and were are effectively now permanent measures, whilst I suppose some were brought in as temporary measures as a result um, of COVID. So I suppose in relation to some of the, the more the permanent measures, some of the key ones there whereby there was a new... Um, moratorium uh, procedure brought in, which effectively provides um, companies with um, what I suppose is a, a breathing space to provide them with time 
um, to review other um, rescue options. Um, There's also a restructuring plan brought in, which was similar to, I suppose, the old um, scheme of arrangement, um, probably more likely to be used in, I suppose, complex uh, restructuring and debt financings. Um, there's only really been a couple of um, restructuring plans engaged in, I suppose, more in, in England um, at a very large scale. And I suppose the moratorium procedure, um, I'm not aware of it being used much at all, really, um, probably because of a result of uh, the various um, government support schemes um, that have been in place that have supported businesses in other ways. And there's been um, at the moment, anyway, um, I suppose a reduced um, need for that. I suppose some of the, the temporary measures that um, have been brought in have um, supported um, businesses and kept them afloat. Um, primarily, I suppose there was a, a restriction on the filing of uh, statutory demands and winding up petitions um, where it could be proven that the difficulties or the fact that the debt was related um, to COVID. So that's obviously had a had a huge impact in terms of keeping distressed companies out of the courts um, where they haven't had to face potential insolvency. There's also new legislation that has been brought in to protect business tenancy rights, effectively meaning that um, businesses and um, commercial tenants are um, protected from facing eviction. So the new legislation was brought in. Probably the more permanent measures haven't been used as much as yet, um, but some of the more temporary measures have been um, really positive in, t- in terms of keeping um, businesses afloat. Absolutely, yeah. So it's 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 um, yeah. I mean, I I suppose that there's a sort of general theme that people will, will go for the simplest measure first, and I think that, that that that's probably a common theme north and south. Um, I suppose in in both areas, I guess you cannot keep an unviable business going. So, you know, in terms of that, you're 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 obviously saying, look, I mean, during COVID, it's good that businesses are 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 rescued, are are, are kept going. But what do you see next, Michael? What, what do you see next happening in, in, in terms of those supports? What, what, what are, the, are the pressure points? Yeah, well, like there's, there's definitely challenges ahead. Um, I suppose it's difficult to make predictions in terms of where things will go. Jim can pitch in in terms of where things are at in the south, but definitely in the north in terms of formal insolvency appointments. You know, they're operating at a fraction of where they would have been um, pre-COVID, I suppose. Where things go from now is difficult um, to answer. I suppose it probably comes down to a question of, Obviously, the economy is bouncing back to a certain extent. It's just whether it can continue to grow um, and to, to effectively compensate for all of the support mechanisms um, winding down and the repayments that are going to now become come into play. But also, it needs the economy is going to need to grow and take on the challenges outside of that in terms of things outside of COVID. You know, in terms of the, the inflationary pressure pressures, the material shortages, supply or the labour supply shortages. Um, you know, there may not be as much um, access to finance as there historically would have been. There's loads of challenges out there. So I think it's um, definitely difficult to say uh, to what extent and when businesses uh, might, um, you know, uh, meet uh, difficulties. But I think it's reasonable to, to suggest that um, there are definitely challenges coming down the line. Okay. Jim, I presume you see you see you see similar issues in the Republic, and I'm thinking of those companies which, um, w- w- which have regarded themselves as rescuable until now, but perhaps are reaching a tipping point. Would no, you have any advice for for for? for, for uh, I think there is a tipping point um, coming, Colin. I think uh, we all know the revenue have been very supportive. The banks have also been very supportive. Okay, banks have not put the main pillar. Banks have not appointed any receivers. Okay. Um, another benefit to, to many companies is that the court system has effectively been closed down for the past 18 months. Okay? There's been no judgments, no, very, very few decisions issued. Um, like, you know, judgment mortgages are down 80%. Um, all this type of, so there is a tipping point coming. And I think the challenge is that, that some businesses don't re, will, probably don't appreciate that consumer habits have permanently changed in certain sectors. That what COVID has done, it's propelled us 10 years into the future. So there's been a massive shift towards online retailing, but it's going to impact on, on, on fast retail shops. So you've got some retail shops that believe that when, they, that when they do reopen, that they'll have business levels back as normal. The reality is they won't have business levels back as normal. Okay? That's a shift online. Okay? I was talking with um, t- Tony Morrissey, who's a well-known um, um, auctioneer of, of pubs. And, um, and Tony is of the view that, you know, that some pubs will never get back up to the level of business that they had before because of changed consumer habits. Now, there's a pub outside M50 that 
that on the first day to open his coffee shop and sold a thousand cups of coffee. Or perhaps we're going to have a more Mediterranean type culture of people going to coffee shops and um, drinking at home, all that type of stuff. So put that side in 50, their, their valuation is plummeted by about 50%. Mm. Um, because it just won't get the level of, of business stuff. So I think the most important thing to do is try and do forecasts okay, for each industry sector. And this is just something accounts are good at. We're good at doing cash flow projections. But cash flow projections are only as good as the assumptions that you use. So you, have, you really have to um, stretch it and, and play, devil's advocate, play devil's advocate where your assumptions are these assumptions reasonable and do the cash flow forecast stack up? Because I fear that many assumptions that have been utilized at the moment are not realistic because you haven't taken into account the permanent change in consumer habits mm-hmm. and in certain sectors such as retail and hospitality. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, there's one other issue I just wanted to, to mention in, in Northern Ireland, the pre packs. Michael, uh, do, do, uh, there's a greater transparency due, due, due to those. I mean, what, what would you advise a general uh, pr- practitioner who might be mentioning pre-pack now? Yeah, I suppose uh, an administration, I suppose, is a, a rescue uh, me- mechanism which um, provides companies with breathing space um, to, to review their options. And in, in some cases, can those companies can continue to trade during administrations. And there's also an option um, to transact uh, what's called a pre-pack. Um, sale and administration. So um, I suppose we all want to see a move towards a more rescue oriented culture. Um, as there'll be so many viable businesses that are impacted by the fallout of COVID. And as a result, there might be more and more um, pre pack admins um, in, the, in the months and years ahead. I suppose there has been some, I suppose, uh, criticism in relation to pre packs, in relation to uh, you know, creditors sometimes see them as potentially not achieving uh, full market value for the assets or business that's been sold. Um, there's been some uh, compliance change in relation or over the last couple of months in relation to SIP 13 and 16, which effectively means now that where there has been a sale or there's a post sale to a connected party um, purchaser in an administration, there's now what's called a statutory obligation um, on that connected party purchaser to either gain the approval of creditors or effectively uh, go to an independent, uh, what's called an evaluator, um, to provide an uh, an opinion um, on the transaction. Um, So that that, that transaction cannot take place without one of those two, either the approval of creditors or the opinion of of the evaluator. So hopefully that'll provide uh, more um, transparency and will answer, I suppose, one of the criticisms Mm of um, pre-packs in the past, you know. It, uh, I, I suppose it's, it's 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 not as formal in the Republic, Jim. It, it's it's no, uh, not. I mean, uh, the UK and so on, petitioners are, are much more tightly regulated. They have much more rules to comply with. But we do have a statement of insolvency practice that deals with, with asset sales to, to, to directors. And the, the reality is, Colin, that in many cases, okay, that when we're selling business assets, okay, it's akin to that the, 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 when a fox has been chased by the rabbit, the rabbit is running for his, his life. The fox is only running for his lunch. Okay, so when we're selling business assets, I mean the most likely purchaser is going to be the existing managing director because that's his livelihood. Okay, yeah. So he'll always pay a fair price for it, more than than would say a competitor who already has a Heidelberg printing press and all that yeah. type of stuff. Yeah. So, so we we do pre-packed type sales where we do a full transparency. We get full valuations. Um, and, and we get approval from, from the Committee of Inspection, yeah. and we always seek to have a Committee of Inspection appointed, and, and frequently in those cases we have the revenue commissioners out, and, and, and we, provided we just find market value, the revenue commissioners have no issues. Yeah. Okay. So it's all about transparency. Yeah. Okay, I understand. North and South. Guys, that is very interesting. It's very interesting to get an update there to understand what's happening, to understand the, the, the concept of, you know, of tipping points, the difficulties of trying to anticipate that. Uh, none of us have a crystal ball, uh, but what we can do is we, we, we can be aware of the structures that are there, aware of the changes that are, that are made recently. So that's absolutely very, very interesting. Jeremy, have we got any questions in? On, on, we, on... we do. Uh, we have one question here now. And I think Jim, I, I, I've heard you mention this in a in previous webinar and I know it's difficult because we haven't got it in process yet. The cost range potentially for a SCARP, um, I suppose a SCARP review, a SCARP process for a, uh, for a firm. Yeah, I, I suppose Germany. How, how long is a piece of string? Um, Indeed. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, no, it, I mean, um, for example, if you're dealing with retail, with a retail chain and lease repudiations, okay, if you don't get landlords that that don't agree voluntarily agree to a lease repudiation, okay, then you're off to you're off to the third court or the high court and costs 
then you, it almost becomes a costly uh, as an exam yeah. ship, and exam ship can cost 100,000 euro. But, but we would like to see a typical, we're hoping to do a typical small um, scarves for SMEs in the 20,000 to 40,000 um, price range. So it's still not cheap, okay? But it, there, is a, there is an awful lot of skill sets involved, there's a lot of negotiation, a lot of forecasting and to, to get it right and, and to get it done well. No, that's that's very informative. I know it's, it's very hard to, to put an exact yeah. price in it, as I say to you now, but it, it really, really is good. Listen, as we actually, if Cornell, if you can click ahead there, um, the guys I know have, uh, Jim, you mentioned you actually have a webinar coming up in this area actually next Friday. If you want to book onto that webinar, it's a, it's an hour long, a very informative. I have seen a, a, some, a similar previous version, as I say to you. Do check it out next Friday afternoon, the 10th at 3 p.m. That's the link there. Uh, we have some articles as well. I know, Michael, you wrote on the consolidation and the changes in June 2020 uh, with, your, with your colleague, Sean, uh, there. So that's, that's there, as I say, in Accountancy Ireland. And also we have, I know, Jim, you've other webinars coming up as well on personal insolvency and yeah. SIPs and so on. Listen, they're all there for you to peruse and to book and so on as well. Uh, so definitely, as I say, I, if you want to learn more, there's plenty and ample opportunities uh, dare to actually go with that one. Cornell, have we any other questions coming in on the insolvency area or in anything else? Um, one thing while, while you're looking at that there, and just to say to anybody attending from Northern Ireland, I didn't forget about uh, UK and Northern Irish tax and business uh, supports. Um, just to say we have some information here and some links. I'm sure a lot of you already get the Institute Tax Newsletter, uh, but we have some updates every week and so on. Uh, this week, I think particularly around the size of five and then the grants uh, and, and so on there. You can get all those at those links. We also have had a very busy period, our colleague uh, Leoncia, who is our Northern Ireland tax lead and with the Northern Ireland Tax Committee on submissions to HMRC. Uh, there was two actually there in uh, July. First one about relation to timely payments and the Institute and its members were not supportive of real-time payments and income tax and CT for the UK was the general gist of that actual um, response to the HMRC. And the second one on the Office of Tax Simplification, we were, as I say, were responsive and actually supportive of widening of the remit of the OTS. But listen, if you have any specific questions on tax, government supports, different things, uh, always contact Leontia and we will have Leontia on as well in, in future uh, shows too. Uh, so she will be making a, a return as I say as well. Uh, but listen, that's a very quick overview of UK um, taxes and so on, Cornell. And finally, uh, Nora has asked for a very quick slot to talk to us about exceptional contacts. Wow. Uh, so Nora, if you're there, you have the floor. Cheers. You can see me. I don't know if my video is on. Yeah, it is on. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I just want to say to everybody, um, there is a facility in revenue for tax agents to, to escalate and to highlight um, delays. Uh, I see uh, um, a member here has, got a, has shared experiences with uh, struggles with VAT registration and delays with my inquiries. The my inquiry service standard is 20 days. Uh, they, they need to come back to you within 20 days. And likewise, at, at peak times, it's 25 days. If you're not getting anywhere or if you have uh, a thread which demonstrates really unsatisfactory service, contact the, the exceptional contacts. So these are, there's, they're named individuals for the specific uh, division. So you have business division, medium-sized enterprise division, or large cases division. They are not, it's not a complaint. You're not complaining about the caseworker, but you're highlighting a, a genuine delay or frustration with the, with the process. And it'll be dealt with in real time. They're the managers of the particular divisions. There's a team of people there. That's why they don't provide a telephone number. They provide an email. So it's a number of people watching out that email. People come to me about my inquiries, and I'm very happy to, to bring my inquiries issues to TALC, and we, we discuss them in detail. But your main remedy for real time problems is the exceptional contacts. I've put up the link to it there on the chat, and it's also on a revenues website. If you go into tax professionals section, and if you go very down to the very last tile on the right hand side, you you can read all about exceptional contacts. So that's it for me. Thanks so much for.
Jeremy? And Conan, I'll just say to you, uh, I, I know Blawnit as well. You've been very good, Blawnit. Hopefully you're still with us. Uh, you have answered a couple of questions there, as I say to you. I'm not sure, have you any further thoughts you'd like to, to share with us if you are still with us, Blawnit? Hopefully you are. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm still here. Yeah, no, there was one question I tried to answer and then I ran out of space. <laughs> oh, well, you can, you, you can share with us if you can now, if it wasn't that private. Um, <laughs> but, and it seems to be a bit of a theme. I mean, it's the question around, you know, how do you force someone to come back to work and, you know, uh, the, the sort of common thread of... The theory, yeah. You know, child care and all of that um, and I suppose where I'd start from here is you know go back to the contract this was all uh, yes okay it's gone on nearly two years but the working from home was a temporary measure and um, you know their place of work is wherever their place of work is in their contract and you know they're meant to be doing x amount of hours as per their contract and um, you know whilst well certainly speak to staff and see you know what is going on you know we we need you to come back and that's why I'm sort of saying consult with people because if you get the buy-in from staff of what you're trying to do and what you're trying to accommodate you know hopefully you will be able to you know if you are able to do the hybrid model or if that role adopts it you will be able to get some happy medium but at the end of the day it is not for the employee to dictate the hours and the place of work and it is that is the employer they sign up for a job in this particular role we went hybrid or we went remote working because of an emergency, you know, and it wasn't that it was out of choice or out of agreement. And um, if the person continues to refuse to return to work, um, you, you can't just outright dismiss someone, but you will ultimately probably go down the road of frustration of contract or could become a disciplinary issue. And um, so that's why it's, it's good to be able to show that you've tried to sort of be, you know, see the, the rhyme of reason with that particular person and to try and, and to, to try and get a result. But certainly it is not for any member of staff to just say, you know, I have childcare issues and, you know, the childcare issues would have existed, you know, pre and, you know, maybe they had a child during the lockdown, you know, I appreciate that there may have been a change in circumstances. Um, but certainly, you know, people have always had childcare issues and people have always been able to come into work um, so I would certainly be flexible in terms of trying to reach resolution. But, you know, there does come a point where the employer will have to draw the line on that. Well, Blonde, I think that's that's very good advice to end up on. Unfortunately, these delicate situations, I'm going to call them, will arise. And mm -hmm. as, it, as, as, as I mentioned earlier, I suppose if anybody has a particular issue like that, everything's unique. Uh, I know you're available for, for a chat, as I say to you, uh, with, with anybody. So that's very much appreciated. And thank you again for, for coming back to us on that. Before we finish, Colin, well, you can hand up, yeah? I do indeed. One final question there is, and this may have been, this may have been dealt with earlier, but it says, for blowing it, can, can you ask employees to voluntarily confirm if they are vaccinated? So in, is, is, is there a one-line answer to that one, blowing it? Uh, it's not straightforward. <laughs> Not <laughs> <laughs> alone, I think actually did put a written answer in there, and, and indeed it, it isn't as I say to you. Uh, you you can't with GDPR, I understand, but uh, yeah. it's, it's a well, I suppose just yeah, just to add that it, it's more so you have to be careful what you do with the information. Uh, okay. so, you know, um, so that's that's where that sort of comes from. Um, yeah, but certainly, you know, um, please feel free to get in contact if anybody has any further queries. I'm happy to help. Well, on it, brilliant. Thanks for that. Listen, before we wrap up here, and we, re we realise we've gone a few minutes over, but we're having a lot of people are still staying on with us. We have some upcoming webinars, Connell, and they click ahead there. I won't bore you with too many of the details. I'm sure you've been getting some emails from us as well. Uh, but particularly if you have charities clients, uh, we'd be delighted to have you along next Thursday uh, morning. We'll be joined by Thomas von Holland uh, from the Charities Regulator, uh, and we're covering all the bases with relation to accounting, reporting, governance, and charities. The following week, both for the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland, your financial reporting updates and so on, a uh, rapidly evolving area. If you're going into practice on the 24th, or if you're even thinking about going into practice, potentially come along and join us. Uh, and also, we will have a number of guest speakers for going into practice day. And look, we have the next practice news. We'd be delighted to have you along as well on the 8th of October. And uh, that is that one. I think, Cornell, from our viewpoints here, all I can say is I'd like to thank all, uh, thank yourself, but also thank all our guests, uh, Nora, Blonad, Jim and, and Michael. But also not to forget to thank uh, people uh, who has been helping us out in the background on this. So our CPD team, so Linda, Emma, uh, Chris, of course, always keeping us uh, online and, and talking and, uh, and so on. Also to thank my colleague Bernie and Ginny as well in relation to all our, our marketing on this. I'm sure I've left somebody out, uh, but just to, to, to thank everyone and thank you guys as well this morning for tuning in. 
Cornell, have you any further thoughts? I just like to. I I I don't think I properly thank Jim and Michael for for our conversation, there, which, was, which was very interesting. And thank you very much, guys, for coming along and bringing your expertise uh, to bear. And obviously, also Ronald as well for that. I, I I think it's resonated strongly with people. So 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 thank you very much. Uh, and Jeremy, of course, yourself for putting it all together as usual. So guys, uh, enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy your weekend. And no doubt we'll be talking to you soon. Look after yourself. Thank you. Bye now. See you.